perhaps I could start by asking you, um, how, how worried are you for your safety? Can Can you outline for our viewers what you believe it is that the state or whoever else is attempting to do to you? Well, look, you know, you need to know the background. Ever since I was, I, I've been ousted from power, there have been 37 by-elections. My party has swept 30 of them. So there's a whole vested interest, which is petrified that general elections this year would mean that I would be back in power. And these people are scared that, that if I'm back in power, uh, then they have a lot to lose and especially the two old uh, political families which have ruled Pakistan for 30 years have massive corruption cases against them. So they're doing everything to get me out of the way. Uh, I've had one assassination attempt and very lucky to be alive because uh, it, it was a death trap. Uh, and I mean, I won't go into details, but I'm just lucky to be alive. And then they have... Uh, sabotaged all the evidence, which there was a joint investigation, investigating committee that was uh, 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 doing a probe into this and all the probe was disturbing. It was leading somewhere and uh, somehow they managed to completely sabotage it. The, or most of the evidence disappeared. So they're, so, so they're out to kill me. And I just two days ago, again, I had a very narrow escape. Um, they warned me out of the way. The other thing they have done is that, you know, someone I've been in public eye for 50 years, I've never had one case against me of, of breaking the law. Just in the last few months, I have 97 cases against me, which range from murder to uh, terrorism, to blasphemy, to sedition. So all this is, if they can't kill me to put me in prison, so that I should not compete in election. And you deny, you deny all the allegations against you? They are complete nonsense, absolute rubbish. And I, whenever they go to court, whenever, these all allegations, remember, whenever they go to court, all of them will be set aside. Um, do you, do you expect to be arrested soon? Well, they've been pretty close four or five times to arrest me, uh, and and all the time when when the news came out that they were coming to arrest me, people came out and you know in thousands and sort of parked themselves outside my house. And the reason is very simple, because the people fear that if they arrest me, they'll kill me. The people know that the ones who try to kill me are sitting in government. And so because they don't trust the government, they come to sort of protect me. Uh, but I, uh, you know, with 97 cases and uh, I'm close to my century, I, I, I have... Uh, no doubt that sometime or the other they will sort of find some something to arrest me. Um, um, can you tell me about what, what happened last week um, when they came to your house? J just explain what happened and tell me your reaction when you saw what was unfolding. Well, I just... Uh, in the morning, this guy, uh, this police guy comes and gives a warrant at my house. My lawyers told me that that warrant was completely illegal. No procedure was followed. They went to the wrong address. You know, there's a certain procedure that if you if you want to uh, uh, arrest someone, there, there's a procedure. It was completely illegal what they did. And what did they come to arrest me for? Now, this is the other interesting thing. This was on the 14th. On the 18th, I was supposed to uh, appear in a court. They were supposed to take me, arrest me, to make me appear in the court. I was already appearing in the court. And worse, 
I had given them that evening, I had gave them an assurity bond that I would be appearing in the court. And the law says, if you give them an assurity bond, they, sh they shouldn't arrest you. And all I was doing was I was just going to present myself in the, in the court, which I did anyway on Saturday. So they completely discarded my assurity because that is not why they came. There were thousands of police that came to my house, including rangers, which is the army. They attacked my house with, from three sides. And there were uh, tear gas and uh, water cannons and rubber bullets. And then there's some cer certain pellet guns they used. I mean, it was this was a, a war zone. But the people, you know, and they were not just my workers, just people, citizens came outside. And they just put up a fight. They refused. Uh, three times I said, look, I'll go and give myself up because I didn't want any bloodshed. And they refused. The people insisted. They said, if they take you, they'll kill you. So uh, eventually they had to back off. But you could give yourself up, couldn't you? And won't your opponent say that actually this is the best course of action, that this is the one that uh, does the most to prevent civil unrest? Look, give myself up. Why? What, what, what is it that I've done wrong? What, the, the reason why they were coming to pick me up was to take me to the court, assuming that I wasn't going there. I already was appearing on the court, and I'd already given them an assurity bond. The law says that if that assurity bond is given, they couldn't pick me up. So it was all illegal. And so, I mean, you give yourself up if you commit a crime. Why do you give yourself up when you haven't done anything wrong? And that's why the people also, look, the people in this country know me for 50 years. They know me for 50 years. I've never, ever broken the law. And just in the last few months, there are 97 cases against me. And all of them, each one of them is just, it's a joke. I mean, people in this country know Imran Khan is not a terrorist. There are about 40 terrorist cases on me of terrorism. But these are serious allegations. Terrorism, inciting people to violence, um, and allegations that your supporters have on many occasions been involved in extremely violent clashes. Look, this is absolute nonsense. There has never been, you know, would you call the terrorism? that there's a peaceful demonstration outside the election commission in Islamabad, and I'm sitting in Lahore and accused of terrorism. Can that ever happen in England? Have you ever heard of someone being called a terrorist because there's you? I go to court and there follows, everyone knows the timing of my court, there are people around them. We come back and there is a terrorist case against them. It's a joke. There are 40 terrorism cases against me. Never in my 26 years of politics have I ever broken the law or asked my, any of my uh, people, my, my workers, ever to break the law. Always we have protested peacefully. Everyone knows this about my party. Now, what happened was that when the rangers started firing tear gas shells outside my house and these water cannons and, and, and these pellet guns, then there was a reaction. There's always a reaction. If you start pelting people with, and, and no one provoked them, and we have all the evidence, no one provoked the police. This happened here, and then when I went for my court case in Islamabad on Saturday, again it happened. The people were <clears throat> walking with me towards the court. They started firing uh, tear gas shells at them. So there was a reaction. But when I went to Lahore High Court, people went with me. I went in, went to the court, came out. Nothing happened. So therefore, you know, when you provoke people, uh, there's always going to be a reaction. Is it now not, though, for the, the court system, the judicial system, to decide whether you and your supporters are guilty of these charges? Well, the judicial, the law of the land is already clear. When they came to arrest me, the law of the land did not, would not allow them to arrest me. They, it wasn't arrest, it was abduction. It was, they were illegally going to pick me up and put me in prison. 
And that's why the people reacted. And secondly, there have been cases of three of my uh, party, senior members of my party, my, one of my senator, my chief of staff, they were picked up, they were taken in custody, and they were tortured. Uh, they faced custodial torture for two days, then they were presented in front of a court. So there is a, oh, we have all the evidence in the last 10 months, 11 months when I've been out of power, there has been a crackdown on the media. One of our best investigative journalists was hounded out of the country, killed in Kenya. Three of our best uh, investigative journalists have been have been hounded out of Pakistan. Two of the media houses have been closed, you know, and then one of the media houses owner, who they, all they were doing was they were giving me uh, exposure on their TV channels. He was put in prison, beaten up. So it's never happened in Pakistan before. What is happening right now, the level of fascism in Pakistan, even in martial laws, we never had this sort of uh, a police state. We never had such a, a crackdown. But as you see it, are, are you the only answer? You, you, the, the, the options you outline, you know, in, involve potentially your arrest. You've talked about potentially your assassination. Um, is there anything else other than you returning to office, returning to power, which, in your view, leads to the diffusing of this situation? Look, the Constitution says clearly that the when you dissolve your assemblies, which we did two of our provincial assemblies, the Constitution is clear. Elections have to be held in 90 days. We had to go to the... Because the government refused... We went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says that the elections have to be on the 30th of April. Now, that's the law of the land. That's the Constitution. All we are asking for is elections, free and fair elections. Why should the government crack down on people asking for elections? And why should this be the abuse of human rights, crack down on political... Hundreds of my workers have been put into jail. Uh, uh, as I said, three of my main people face custodial torture, which is banned everywhere in the world. So what is what have we done to have this wrath of the state against us? I mean, which law have we broken? I keep going to, they keep come bringing these false cases against me. I keep going to uh, 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 one court after another to get bail. I am following the law, but the government is not. They made us into a banana republic. There's, there are no fundamental rights left in Pakistan. I mean, they are barging. There's a, the cases last night. They did a crackdown. They barge into workers' houses in three a.m. in the morning, and this is all documented. And this sort of thing, I'm telling you, in martial laws, Musharraf's martial law. I was in the opposition. I never faced this then. That was liberal compared to what is going on right now. I, I want to pick you up on um, um, uh, a, a couple of things. You've talked about, you know, there have been allegations of US involvement um, uh, in what's happened over the last few months. Do you have any evidence of that? Well, the evidence is a cipher. Cipher means the secret correspondence which an ambassador has with the foreign office and then reported to the prime minister. So this cipher... Uh, which recorded the conversation between the Pakistani ambassador in Washington and the U.S. Uh, he was the Under Secretary of State on South Asia, Donald Liu. There were note takers on both sides. They took notes, so it was an official meeting. In that, he says, the American says that you have to remove Imran Khan, the Prime Minister, in a no confidence. Uh, otherwise, there'll be consequences of, for Pakistan. Amongst other things, this was the bottom line. The next day, there's a no confidence in, in the parliament against me. And our government goes within weeks. So that is the evidence. However, later on, we discover that it wasn't initiated by the US. It was our own army chief, our ex-army chief. He was the one who was lobbying against me and this consp conspiracy was initiated by him. And he then told the US that Imran Khan was supposed to be anti-American. 
and therefore this uh, this uh, cipher came from the US. But the cipher was presented to the cabinet, to the National Security Council, to the parliament. The Pakistan government officially demarched the US for interfering in Pakistan's affairs. And, and, and what do you think, if any, is the US involvement at this point? I don't really know. I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, I would see it very strange that if the US would be backing governments or, or any government uh, and would be opposed to the party, which is by far the most popular and the biggest party in Pakistan. In fact, the only federal party in Pakistan. So, you know, I maybe they've, I hope they've learned a lesson that you do not go against a popular uh, party, which is, uh, you know, which is going to sweep the elections. What advantage would the US have to oppose it? Um, and, 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 what did the US say to you directly, if anything, um, at the start of the invasion of Ukraine uh, 13 months ago um, about your visit to Moscow? Well, look, you know, when you visit other countries, there's a lot of preparation work done beforehand. So it's not once one day you get up and you said, I'm, I'm touring Moscow. There were a couple of months of preparation because, you know, when you have bilateral relationship, there's a lot involved. What, what do you have to give to them and, you know, what you expect from them and so on. And a lot of preliminary work done before you go. So how I was not supposed to know that the day I arrive in Moscow, uh, a few hours later, uh, the Russians invade U Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it was uh, bad timing. But no way... Would, would my government would ever endorse anything which is, uh, which is a military conflict? But I think what maybe I'm, I'm now speculating because soon after that, my government was gone. Uh, maybe they objected that when we did not condemn Russia, because we, like India, we wanted to stay neutral because we felt that, uh, you know, condemning Russia would come at a huge cost to Pakistan. We have 100 million people vulnerable in this country, 50 million below the poverty line, 50 just above it. And we wanted cheap oil from Russia because the oil prices had gone through the roof. And secondly, we wanted to buy 2 million tons of wheat from Russia. So we did not want to jeopardize what would have been the interest of the people of this country by making a statement, uh, you know, which would have endangered the, these these contracts. But, when but in any travel. case... But, yeah, but when you traveled to um, Moscow, I mean, Russia's intentions were, were clear. I mean, you know, you say you couldn't have known that day that Russia's invasion would be so imminent. But, you know, I was in Ukraine at the time and everyone there felt that an invasion was imminent. Do, do, do you feel that the, that the um, U.S. Um, and other uh, nations, uh, more of Ukraine's allies, would accept that explanation uh, for that visit to Moscow? Look, as far as we are concerned, I'm, I'm talking about Pakistan. The visit was just for the interest of people of Pakistan who were suffering from COVID. Remember, COVID-19 created this commodity super cycle and inflation was killing our people and most of the developing world. So our interest was to get, like India, and remember, India is an ally of the U.S. In Quad, it's a strategic ally. India got 40% discount for buying oil from Russia and refused to condemn them, being an ally. So countries like us do not have the luxury of making moral statements when you have 100 million vulnerable people. That is your main interest. <clears throat> and in any case, let me just say that this morality is very selective when it comes to Western countries. I haven't seen any condemnation of India or what is happening in Kashmir, where all international laws have been violated and the human rights, and which bothers us, but it doesn't bother the, the Western countries because it's not their issue. Why should issues that are with them should bother us? If I was not in a responsible position, I would certainly make moral statements because I'm anti-war. I'm anti-conflicts. I don't think... Problems are solved like that. 
But when you have 100 million people in our country, vulnerable, twice the population of Great Britain, you do you have to think twice. And 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 lastly, um, Mr. Khan, um, what you you know you talk about those Western countries. What what would your message be to them about your own case? Um, um, you know, you say you are, you know, b being mistreated. I guess is a light word. Um, um, you know, you you say you're being targeted, um, by the government. What what would you say to, um, to some of those Western countries about about your own case and whether they should themselves respond? Look. I mean, Pakistan will have to sort out its problems internally. No outside country really can help you that much. But what we do expect from Western countries is to speak about the values they propagate. Human rights, democracy, rule of law. That's all. I, should, I think they should speak about that because all these are being violated in Pakistan. Neither the constitution is being respected there is no semblance of rule of law here. Fundamental rights of our people are being violated. Custodial torture, which, you know, as I said, is condemned everywhere in the world. So that's all. I mean, we just want them to speak about it because, uh, you know, hoping that will put enough pressure. But eventually, we have to solve our problems internally.